silver price versus supply. If it's really supply and demand, how can you have $8 silver when you've depleted 1.5 billion ounces? Does supply and demand dictate the price in silver? <laughs> I think we just answered the question. Gregor Gregerson, the founder of Silver Bullion, will be joining us for our next live stream coming up tomorrow, Friday, the 23rd of August at 12 p.m. CEST for our European viewers, 6 a.m. Eastern for viewers in the U.S. We'll be taking a look at nickel and going over nickel's recent positive moves and why nickel is on everyone's radar. Nickel, gold, silver, current events with Silver Bullion founder Gregor Gregerson coming up tomorrow, August 23rd at 12 p.m. CEST, 6 a.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to this channel or have not already done so, please do subscribe to the channel, click on the bell to be notified on new updates, and do give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. We appreciate your support. Our guest today is David Morgan, the Silver Guru, publisher of The Morgan Report. David is also the author of The Silver Manifesto and Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money from the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave. And we are delighted to have David here again as our guest. Good day, David, and welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Glad to have you back again, David. Really appreciate it. Uh, gold is up some 20% since we last spoke with you back in October of 2018. The price rally in gold and silver in the last few months has certainly been a welcome for bullion buyers. And your call of 1,400 gold in 2019, it's now a reality, my friend. Great call. And it's amazing how the sentiment on Precious metals has turned in the last three months from all the negativity in the past six years. My question is, do you think that the uh, price surge is full evidence that gold and silver are off to the races? And at what price point do you think any doubts about a bull market will completely disappear? Oh, that's a good question. Well, <clears throat> right now, the way I see it, you're asking me the question is that most of this um, buying pressure has been done on the institutional side. On the retail side, a lot of the bigger dealers, retail dealers, have said uh, and told me pretty much across the board that a lot of um, retail investors are selling back their gold at this $1,500 level as we're doing the interview. And they aren't convinced that the bull, you know, there's a new bull lake taking place. They're just happy to get out. You know, they bought it 1,500, six, seven years ago. It's there now. They're just getting out and just forgetting about gold. So there's that side of it as well. And your question is, you know, what level do we see, um, you know, the public, I guess, convinced that, you know, this bull market's for real? I think two things. One is we need to reach a um, point where we do get a consolidation, profit-taking, you know, sell-off, whatever you want to call it and rebuild a base at some level. And I don't know where that is. Maybe it's 1450, maybe it's 1400. I think it's impossible at this point to see gold trade below the 1350, 1360 breakout. So that will take place at some point. <clears throat> the other part is when gold was at these levels, the last time silver was at around $25 an ounce. So I really want to see silver confirmed gold get into the, you know, the $20 an ounce level. I think that's holding back some people as well, that uh, you know, silver is performing, but not to the, you know, it's not really outperforming gold, although the ratio has gone from like 95 to 85, I think it's about 88 as we're doing the interview. So, you know, until silver gets into the gold silver ratio gets like 70 or better, I don't think you're going to see a lot of new participation in these markets, especially on the silver side. So I think we have more work to do. I'm pretty confident it will be accomplished. I think that once the, you know, the public comes back into the market, you will see um, silver outperform. And it's just going to take probably a little bit more time. You know, I said 1400 is the minimum. I, you know, it's always tough to gauge you know, where the market's going. I mean, I didn't dream that we'd have a six-year consolidation in the gold market, but that's what it took. And the longer the base, 
the bigger the move up. So we have a pretty big base to move up from on both the metals. The other part of uh, why it's not being robust on the retail side is the bid-ask spread is extremely low. In fact, believe it or not, <clears throat> the um, some of the dealers really don't want to buy back some product. They're so full of inventory that uh, they rather not buy it back. So they offer their offer to buy back certain uh, gold, silver products, pr primarily gold. There's not much selling on the silver side. It's still so cheap. But on the gold side, there's a fair amount of people taking their their break even, their profit, their whatever, just like overloaded, whatever the reason. So mostly it's the ETFs. You see these big moves in the ETFs. You see it going into Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank, I think, has taken possession of, I think it's 9 million ounces of physical silver in the last month or so. And um, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of work to do, I think, really, for this um, re- you know, bullish phase to really get going as far as, I mean, obviously $200 moves a big move. I'm not trying to say, I'm trying to say is to get participation where people are excited about the gold market again. I'm surprised, but, and I'm not a perma bull, but you know, as soon as the breakout happened, I mean, it's right on it. My members were right on it. I showed them on the chart. I said, look, you got to get in. And you know, we trade and invest. So I told them the last thing you want to do is sell anything on your core holdings. And we are, I have been taking sub profits at these levels of my trading position. <clears throat> but uh, it's exciting times and it's here to stay. I'm convinced of it. I just don't think, uh, you know, well, I don't know why the public is so leery at this point. I guess they've just been burned for so many years that they're sure that the cartel is going to sell everything off and they're going to see this big drop in the gold price again. And they, you know, are going to be, you know, discouraged one more time. <clears throat> Yeah, I hear you. That's um, <clears throat> where I, I think we're seeing the same things over in uh, Singapore. We we did see some uh, pretty good selling, but then uh, it turned and we saw quite a bit of buying. And, and I think overall the sentiment is they want to see gold um, be able to handle the beatdowns and, and breakdowns that, yeah. that come its way first. And then I think they're going to pile, they'll pile in. But um, is the uh, commitment of traders report also showing data that support that gold and silver prices are heading higher? Very surprising. I mean, I look at it not as often as I used to. I used to you know, study it every week. I mean, it's yeah. almost since the advent of the SLB and the GLD and you know, some of the other ETFs, uh, the COT is still important, and I do look at it. And lately, I've been looking at it very uh, avidly, as I used to in the past. So... <clears throat> The COT on gold got up to, I think it was 613,000 contracts, open interest. I have all the data here. I'm printing it out week to week like I used to. It looks like it was uh, 600 and basically 17,000. Anyway, I was looking for the final, you know, sell-off. And the sell-off came like the following week, and it was 53,000 contracts, if memory serves. And the price didn't really go down at all. It was neutral to slightly higher. Have not seen that kind of a volume of selling take place and the gold price stay firm. So it, the market is definitely trading differently than it has in the past. <clears throat> the paper paradigm doesn't seem to have control. You're not seeing these kind of moves where I expected to see gold test the $1,400 level, and it did intraday, traded five contracts and went right back up. I mean, these are unusual trading patterns for the gold market. So I'm convinced that at this point in time, the physical market's actually taking control of gold right now. <clears throat> the problem I have with that, I love to see it. I want to see it. The problem is, and maybe I misstated it to my members, although I've done a video since then for my membership, I didn't want to leave them the impression that the physical market's taken over from here on off, from here on out. Because I've seen a few instances in my many years in this market where there is a physical control for a while, then the entity XYZ out there, be it a nation state, be it a sovereign wealth fund, be it a hedge fund, be it a large individual, be it a drunken miller, I don't know who it is, gets their, their, their bid satisfied and they get their physical gold and it gets tucked away in their vault. Now that's accomplished. Now it goes right back in the paper paradigm where 
gold's allowed to move, you know, five bucks a day kind of a thing. So I don't want to leave anyone with the misimpression that we're on our way forever. The physical market has control now from this point onward. It certainly looks like it has control right now. But again, to repeat myself, once that whatever's driving it is satisfied, that 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 amount is accomplished, it's put away, it's done, then we might get right back into a situation where we've got these narrow trading range and we're building a base or whatever. But um, eventually, I think both the metals will have a breakout to the point where it does go physical alone and the physical demand is so high that there's really no way to put the genie back in the bottle. So you'll have a time where we saw, like during the 2008 financial crisis, where you basically have two markets. You have a paper paradigm and you'll have a physical market. And the spreads on those will be different and expanding. And that's when the uh, paper paradigm will have a lot of pressure to either close down or uh, they will never default because we read the contract, they're allowed to settle in cash. So, I mean, to say, oh, the COMEX defaulted, they can't by contract. I mean, if they could force you to take a check that they can write out of thin air, they, they'll never technically default by their definition. By our definition, they've defaulted because they can't produce, you know, the metal that someone wants. But that's not how they view it. So anyway, I probably overstated the case, but that's the way I see it. Oh, that's fine. But um, just curious, is the rise in uh, gold and silver prices a, a warning sign of an impending economic crisis? Or do you think people are, are just trying to find that safe haven because th there are a lot of things happening in the world, whether it's in the, the Gulf or whether it's the trade war with, with China? It's both. both. Right now, it's a precursor to the ultimate. The ultimate is failure of the system, failure of government failure of trust of government. And, uh, you know, people say governments don't fail. Well, take a look at the Roman Empire. Take a look at the Byzantine Empire. Take a look at the Mayan Empire. Take a look at the empires. They all fail. And when they're based on a you know, pack of lies with a pack of uh, the ruling elite that care about themselves only and could care less about the peons below them, uh, you have a crisis on your hands. And right now it's manifesting as a currency crisis with trade wars. And you're seeing a move into the metals as a safe haven. And everyone, not everyone, but the vast majority believe that things will continue down the road the same as they are. Tomorrow's going to be just like today. And I hope that's the case, <clears throat> but it may not be. History certainly proves that there are these disruptions that take place very rarely. But when they do take place, they are huge. And I mean, you go to the Dark Ages <clears throat> as an example. And normally it's been uh, in certain locales, in other words, on the hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic. I mean, that, you know, if you're in Austria or Italy or whatever, you can escape it. But this time there's no escape, in my view. It's going to be a dollar demise. And when it's a dollar demise, that affects every country on the planet. So, yeah, if you're Amish, you're probably going to be okay. And if you're a Mennonite, you're probably going to be okay. And if you're living in the outback as a, with the Aborigines, you're probably going to be okay. But anyone in a you know city-state is not going to be okay. There's going to be huge disruptions, though, in the credit system, but everything that depends on the credit system, which is basically everything that you can look at in a store, any transportation, any communication, and of course the banking industry at large. Now, I'm not trying to overstate the case. Governments are really a lower on the on the pyramid than uh, most people think. It's really at the bottom. I mean, if you go and look at the movie Thrive, it shows you plain and simply that governments, like the the lowest thing, is us peons. But then up from there is government. Then up from there is the commercial banking system. And up from there is the international banking system. And up from there is the investment banking system. And up from there is like the IMF and the World Bank. So it's you know, all the stratus going up, 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 up to the top of the tippy pyramid is all banks. It's the banks that run the governments. It's not you know, no one says, well, communism, socialism, fascism, you know, social democracy. These bankers don't care what you use as your ruling philosophy. As long as they make the money for you, they could care less if you're communist, socialist, democratic, democratic, socialist. They don't care as long as they're in control of the money. And this is, you know, where we have such infighting about 
political idealism and all that. And believe me, I have my own views on that. I don't really want to get into it. But what I do, I, you know, I love freedom. I won't say that. But when you are controlled by the powers that be that control the money, and that's the ultimate power or control mechanism, they don't care. They really don't care. These guys, these people, these entities, whatever they are, are looking after control. They're not looking after, I mean, when you're a trillionaire, how much more money do you need? I mean, it's not about the money to them. It's about control. That's what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you touched on uh, Thrive, which is available on YouTube if, if people want to go ahead and, and have a look. And the, the pyramid that you're talking about, it, it showed the different entities such as governments, corporations, central banks. Yeah, I'm sorry. I left that out. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. All, all that these, these things you mentioned, um, government, corporate, central banks, uh, global financial entities, IMF, BIS, all forming the power of the financial elite. Um, the one question, though, why is the government at the lowest rung of the pyramid and the BIS at the top? Basically, money is power okay. and power is control. And the people that have the power to print the money have the control. So if they have the control, they control government. And the gov reason the government is at the bottom is because corporations are above that. Now, corporations are based on credit. So you can have very lousy, crappy corporations that lose money year after year after year that are still thought of as being very powerful, important entities, but they don't make any profit. So in a real free market, the right to succeed is also the right to fail. So if they don't make yeah. a profit, they should fail. But since they're chummy chummy with the um you know uh what do you call it uh crony capitalism they're able to go to their banking buddies and stay alive by borrowing more money i mean you look at you know i mean you look at lockheed way back when i mean got to three dollars a share and was bailed out you look at general motors and bailed out look at ford is bailed out like some of the banks are bailed out bank sounds a good but no so it's about control and if you control the money supply you have control over everything. And that means the corporations, the corporations are above the government because as it was laid out in the movie network, you know, he was explaining on his uh, TV interview or whatever it was, I forget the movie exactly, that there is no US of A, there's no USSR, there's no Europe, there's IT&T, AT&T, 3M. It's corporations, and these are international corporations that have no uh, boundaries. They are global. They're globalists, and it's a global situation where they're for profit only. See, the problem I view of capitalism, and this is going to, you know, people think, well, David's on the left, and I'm really not on the left or the right. But regardless, I, I've started to use the word conscious capitalism. I mean, you know, I think the profit motive is the best. I think competitiveness is probably a good thing on balance. But the problem with unconscious capitalism is there's built-in obsolescence. I mean, if you are going to be a good steward of the resources that we have, if you build an automobile or an iPhone or a refrigerator or whatever, or house, a house is probably not a good example, but a lot of these things are designed to last two years or three years. Yeah. Or the car, maybe, you know. So, but you, if you were doing it consciously, you build a car that last 40 years or whatever. Now, they're mechanical. They're going to wear out. and Parts have to be replaced. I'm not naive. But the design philosophy would be to make the best to last the longest and make the best use of the resources available for as long as possible. And then when it wore out, it would be designed to where it could be easily replaced. So you'd have a way to replace the parts that wear out the easiest, like brakes on an automobile. That's very simple to replace them um, and this type of thing. So when, we're, when you're driven by profit only and you're not really thinking through what the ultimate consequences are, we've done ourselves a big disservice. And unfortunately, that's been the case for way too long. I mean, if you're going to drill oil and not – adhere to, let's say, environmental principles that are beneficial to the area at large or the planet at large, you're doing a big disservice in the long run. Yeah, your bottom line might look better on your quarterly statement, 
but what are you doing overall? And these are the kind of thinking patterns that we must get away from. And it's almost too late, in my view, in some of these areas, because we've gone too far for too long. And to be able to come back and be in balance is going to be the ultimate challenge. And nature has the final say, believe it or not, uh, nature has the final say. And so money is not a solution. You know, if we get a, even a sound money system, which would be a help if you've pushed the environmental system so far that it's not able to come back fully, then you are in a situation where no amount of money could solve the problem, no amount of technology could solve the problem. I mean, very few people talk about this anymore, Patrick, but if it takes 10 calories of energy to produce one calorie of food, how long is that going to go on? Not very long. The, these financial elite at the top, are they favorable towards gold or do they see gold as a threat? It depends who it is. Uh, okay. I'd say most of them see it as a threat, but there have been in the past notables that were favorable to you know an honest money system and gold being part of that. I'd say on balance right now, most are unfavorable to it, but it could still be put back into the system uh, just to regain confidence for the uh, the masses, you know, if things yeah. blow apart the way I think they could, then the one of the solutions could be to say, okay, okay, we get it. You know, gold's going to be part of the new, you know, globo, the new currency of the world. It's not going to be a dollar or a Aussie dollar, a Canadian dollar, or Zim dollar or anything. It's going to be a one world currency and it's called the Globo. And the Globo is going to be comprised of these currencies and gold. And that's it. And everyone, there is no currency fluctuations anymore. There's no competing currencies. There's no devaluations because there's one currency and one currency only. It's a worldwide currency and this is it. And it's all for your own good. Do you think that these financial elite, as, as we're calling them, they're in control. Do you think they'll allow gold and silver prices to rise past their, their previous all-time highs? Or like you said, do you think they're, they're just going to give us a little bit of meat on the bone and just kind of let us mosey along? Well, I think that's, that they don't have ultimate control. I think that the market does. I'm still that much of an idealist. But I really believe that to be true. I mean, especially on silver, because banks hold a fair amount of gold and you know, push comes to shove and want to push the price down, you know, some bank, it's your turn to cough it up like they did during the London gold pool. I mean, basically, they, they tried to hold the price down and the gold pool of London had a great deal of gold and they did their best to suppress the price, but they ran out. <clears throat> so I'm convinced that if there's enough purchasing power that they really couldn't control it. I think that's the case. Do they want to control it? Yes. Will they try to define it? Yes. But as I said earlier, you know, the the truth of the matter is that the paper paradigm on the COMEX mainly, and of course, there's a London uh, LBMA and other, you know, Singapore exchange. But, you know, most of that <clears throat> uh, market that's paper can be overcome by physical buying. And I think that will take place in this next run up. Uh, it's not imminent. It's not going to happen in 2019 or probably 2020, but by 2022 it might it could happen at any time, but no, I think, and they'll, you know, they'll do, they, the governments will stop it. I mean, it could be maybe illegal to buy it again, which I doubt, but that's possible. But if that were the case, there's always a free market that would buy it anyway. Yeah. And then there's, um, oh, they could put a limit on, you know, you can only buy so much and all that stuff. And I want to scare people, but no, I think, uh, well, ultimately, first of all, they will ignore it as long as they can especially silver. I mean, they yeah. might look at gold because, again, the banks hold it, but no one in the elite look at silver as a monetary asset, which is really good for us because that means that people have control. They have control of the silver market, not the banks. So, I mean, the banks have control of the paper silver market, but not the physical silver market. So that's um, to be determined. I do believe that there will be a run in the gold market that's unprecedented. I think it's going to be a run that's a worldwide run, that there's going to be a loss of confidence in the system at large, and there'll be failures across the board. 
And I think a lot of it will start with what we were talking about earlier. I think that this food crisis, which everybody likes to eat, you know, it's not just to have it, you got to have it. Uh, it's going to happen by the end of this year is going to start waking people up that when they go to their supermarket and um, I'll throw out an example of uh, grapes for an example, uh, aren't there in December, you know? I mean, who gets grapes in December in Washington State where I live? Well, I do. Why? Because they import them from South America. So we're so stupid, we think, you know, <laughs> you have grapes in December. No, it's only due to the modern world and our, our ability to trade with other nations that we have the luxury of having that kind of fruit in the middle of winter in a place like this that you can't even grow grapes part of the time, and you can in some areas. I want to misstate that. but So if that's where we'll see it, and people pay attention to two things, basically, food and energy costs. And those are the two things that are taken out of the CPI, you know, the, the actual government mandated consumer price index takes the two things that humans need most out of the equation, food and, and, and energy. Ridiculous. But this is the world we live in. This Orwellian make-believe Things are what I say. Don't look out the window and tell me what you see. Here, let me hypnotize you. This is a real thing. Okay, so I guess one way we the people can speak is through the markets and looking at things like uh, gold and silver to let them know we don't exactly want or trust their monetary system anymore. Um, how can um, how would the financial elite depicted in this pyramid hold up now with the growing influence of China and the BRICS block of nations? Because it, in that pyramid, it seemed that uh, most of the, the elements in that pyramid were from the Western countries. Yeah, I call it the Anglo-American empire. I mean, it's basically through London, <clears throat> we're through New York. And uh, it is a Western influence. And then the BRICS uh, nations have tried their best to uh, move away from the dollar domination. And they've done a fairly good job at that. And so it remains to be determined how well they've extricated themselves from the dollar dominance of the Anglo-American empire. Um, <clears throat> they certainly have decreased their holdings of U.S. treasuries. They've done a lot of settlement in their own currencies. So you've got, you know, a lot of contracts are based on yuan. You've got Russia, the yuan trading with each other's currencies. So they have done a great deal to move away from a dollar-denominated situation, but not totally. I still think at this juncture, if the dollar failed, it would affect everyone, including the BRICS. But the BRICS are trying their best to mitigate that situation. And the longer you know, the Silk Road goes and the more China manifest by buying assets in the ground. I mean, there's no better storage facility than Earth itself, in my view. I mean, if you're buying yeah. resources like, you know, copper and lithium and molybdenum and uh, vanadium and, you know, cobalt or whatever uh, <clears throat> throughout Africa and other locations, and you own those outright, and then you're buying up areas where you can actually farm and you own those outright, I mean, you're doing a pretty good job of your use of capital. You're converting that paper into a real asset that has very big meaning as far as your industrial base and feeding your population is concerned. So China has done a fairly good job of turning this uh, Keynesian experiment into real assets. But they have major problems, too. I'm not trying to paint a inaccurate picture. They've done better maybe at spending their money prudently, but they still have massive problems because of the Keynesian disease of, you know, printing money out of thin air and loaning it to willy-nilly without prudence and getting a misallocation of capital, building these ghost cities and giving money to, you know, basically people that all they want to do is get greedy, get rich and not really produce anything worthwhile <clears throat> with the, you know, loan that they got to make a, you know, XYZ corporation and never happened, but they, you know, pocketed the money and took off to, you know, a different nation state or whatever. I mean, a lot of crap is going on. It always happens. I mean, none of this stuff is new. <clears throat> Excuse me. None of this is new. At the end of the age of empire, you see rampant uh, legal stealing, uh, legal uh, 
And I say legal from the aspect that uh, the laws get changed. It's like in Bastier's book, The Law. I mean, they basically contort, and twist, and uh, stretch what's legal and what isn't for their benefit. And it's basically taking as much as they can get. I mean, it turns into a big greed game at the, at the end. And, of course, the people at large suffer. I mean, the biggest discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots grows every year. And people, um, you know, get upset, and rightfully so. And then, you know, just taxing the rich alone isn't the solution either. I mean, there's so many problems that are so deep. It's hard, It's difficult to go through them one, one, one by one. And really have a solution. But basically, I mean, the solution, as I've said before, is very simple. It's honesty. I mean, if you have an honest financial system, um, then you have a much better chance of uh, having a more, let's say, balanced system. But when you can, uh, you know, borrow money, take it offshore, not have it on your balance sheet, you know, write it off. I mean, all the, you know, you fail as a bank. So, but you get a bonus at the end of the year because the, all that burden is put on the taxpayers. Uh, it's their fault. Well, no, it's the corporation's fault. The corporation should be the one to fail or the bank should be the one to fail. And the people that bought their bond should be out of luck. You know, I'm sorry, folks, you picked the wrong bank to invest in. You lose. But that's not the way it's working. The way it's working is, well, if they don't lose, they get a bonus. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but that's how it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an upside down world. David, let's let's talk about silver. I've I've watched one of uh, your other presentations online on the the analysis of the silver market back in 2018, and you shared some uh, pretty interesting data, which I hope you can give us an update to. First, I want to ask you about the silver market balance, where you showed that silver prices were depressed in the 90s and early 2000s when silver in inventories were actually in a deficit. Can you help us understand about why this seems to turn our understanding of supply and demand and the impact of prices on its head? I'll do my best, Patrick. It's, you know, it's in a real market, you know, supply and demand should set price. I mean, it's pretty simple. The basic laws of economics call laws for a reason, yet today's topsy-turvy world doesn't seem like they apply. So if you go back to 1990 to uh, 2005, we're in a deficit of about 100 million ounces a year. So to keep balance between supply and demand, we depleted the 2 billion ounces of physical silver that existed in 1990 down to 500 million in 2005. So we took off 1.5 billion ounces that were basically eaten up. Eaten up how? Well, eaten up in some of it went to landfills, but a lot of it were cell phones and computer screens and flat screen TVs and automobiles and all these thousands of uses that silver has, anything electrical or electronic. Then the rebirth of mining really started to take place in the early 2000s, driven mostly by China. And we got 2006 where we started producing more silver through mining and recycling that was greater than the deficit. So we started to build inventories. So since 2006 till now, we're back up to about 2.2 billion ounces. But if you look at a plot of silver price versus supply, and maybe I can do it here while I were talking, but if you look at um, 2005 for the silver price when the inventory was 500 million ounces, I'm going to try to do this while um, sure. I'm talking. You'll find that the price was pretty darn low, even though the supply was extremely low. And um, <clears throat> so I'm going to move this. I'm looking here. I'm going to move this to uh, let's see if I can get to 20 years and update this chart. So I'm looking at uh, 2005 going across your eyeball. And, yeah, like $7 silver in 2005 when the supply was at the lowest it's been wow. in decades. So if it's really supply and demand, how can you have $8 silver when you've depleted 1.5 billion ounces of silver? Then you look up 2011 when we peaked at roughly $50. And by that time, um, we've gone up 
600 million ounces. We were gaining about 100 million ounces a year. We were losing 100 million ounces. Then, you know, mining and recycling brought it to about basically adding 100 million ounces a year. So that's easy to do. 100 million times six years is 600 million. So you're at 1.1 billion. So you're at a point where the price is at an all, not at all time high, a nominal double top 50. It's been there in 1980. And uh, you built up the inventory by 600 million ounces. So does supply and demand dictate the price in silver? <laughs> I think we just answered the question. It's the amount of buying that's on paper that determines the price of the physical paradigm. And that's what you pay in the physical world for it if there's enough supply. And most of the time there is. Okay. How about the um, global financial wealth? Can you give us an idea of silver's share of global financial wealth and how yeah. significant it is today. Yeah. Well, I have to tip my hat to Jeff Christian because Jeff is the one that brought it to my attention. I knew it was low, but Jeff did the um, did the lecture on it <clears throat> at the Silver Summit a few years ago. But the global um, wealth in terms of gold is roughly 1%. I think it's slightly under that. But the global wealth in terms of silver is 0.02%. So I just actually wrote a, um, a uh, little basic uh, update <clears throat> to David Smith, who works with us here at the Morgan Report. And I guess I turned off my phone. Well, I could do it from memory, but um, he asked me for kind of a, a punchline <laughs> or a, a wake-up call about silver. And so I said, well, silver will, will shine – it will something and then it will skyrocket and it will still stupefy the vast majority of investors. Mm. But think about the fact that silver represents 0.02% of the world's financial system. It would need an increase of a factor of 50 times to get to 1% of the world's financial system and in an all-out currency crisis, it's not unimaginable to me to see 1% of the world want to go to the silver market yeah. as a safe haven investment. Is it still true that uh, if everyone in the U.S. And, and only the U.S. bought, let's say, two ounces of silver, they would corner the silver market oh, every yeah. year? Sure. Oh, sure. Yep. Wow. Yeah, maybe now it's two and a half ounces, but I mean, it's roughly that, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, well, just think what we just said. I mean, if 0.02% represents the financial assets globally, yeah. I mean, it's so underloved. And, you know, there's another problem with silver that, you know, I've talked about. Not too many do, and that's the accessibility of silver. Everybody thinks silver is, like, easily accessible. Well, that's true if you're in Singapore or North America. But in South America, even in Mexico, well, Mexico is fairly easy to get silver. But most South America, it's not. Most of Asia, it's not. And most of Europe, it's not. And so, well, wait a minute, David. Are you out of your mind? It's a world market. Well, it is for the paper silver. That's no problem. But when we're talking about the physical silver market, if you're in Europe, you're going to pay 17% value-added tax, 10% value-added tax. So you go down to the local coin dealer with your currency, your euros, or your um, pound sterlings or whatever, and you say, I want to buy some silver, uh, the coin is going to talk you out of it or you're going to talk yourself out of it. You say, well, you buy this gold for no value-added tax, but if you buy silver, you're going to pay 17%. What, what 17% yes. more? So I got to see a 17% rise in silver before I break even on this investment? Are you kidding me? No, not kidding you. That's it. Now, that's... I'm speaking in a general broad brush way because there are exceptions just like there are in uh, U.S. and Canada as far as like if you're buying certain coins or what's considered to be um, uh, a different form. But I don't want to get too far into the nitty gritty. Generally speaking, what I've said is accurate mm -hmm. and it's difficult to buy silver. And I, I think it's deliberate personally. I really – why – why is there a VAT on silver and not gold in Europe? I mean, why? What's the reasoning there? You know, well, it's to discourage buying it. That's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's really the reason. No one will say it. I'll say it. But that's. Yeah, I hear you. So um, 
basically there's really not enough silver for half the world's population to even for half the world's population to to get in on well if you look at the you know what we think we know about the amount of gold and silver out there there's roughly six billion ounces of gold and the population of the world is stated to be seven billion people so that means there's roughly an ounce, not quite, an ounce of gold for everybody on the planet. But there's 2 billion ounces of silver, and there's still 7 billion people on the planet. So there's a lot less silver, a third of an ounce or so for everybody on the planet versus what there's in gold. So an investable form, I'm not talking about, you know, plated silver, tea sets and stuff like that that would have to be melted down and turned into bullion. I'm not talking about I'm talking about what physical investment silver exists right now and what investable gold exists right now. It's about a three to one discrepancy. It's actually more gold per person available than there is silver. So I guess with those words right there, we should be buying more silver. But um, I've I've asked this uh, question a lot of times to to guests where um, if, if gold hit 10,000, what would they do? Um, but I kind of switched it up. And if, if silver were to hit $100 per ounce or $200 per ounce, would you be selling, holding, buying more? Or wh where would you be at? Yeah, I would look at it, you know, not so much as the dollar price, but the value. Because mm -hmm. the value may not really be determined in, uh, in a number if yeah. there's a real currency crisis. But what does it buy in terms of automobiles? What does it buy in terms of real estate or raw land or bushes of wheat? That's pretty easy to determine what the value is. So if it's overvalued, I would look to be a seller. I mean, I'm not married to it. I'm married to it philosophically for the honesty aspect of it. But uh, no. If it's overvalued, I'll be looking for something that's undervalued at the time, which could be raw land. It might be a biotech company. It could be, you know, a business or two. I don't know. But certainly, I don't think there's a reason to invest and not take advantage of the market when it's overvalued. It's overvalued. Personally, I will hold some uh, regardless, just kind of because it's been my life and it'll give me something of a legacy to pass on to my kids. But I certainly am not going to hold on so tight that I'm not going to take advantage of it being overvalued. So, you know, what is the paper price when it's overvalued? I don't really know yet. 200 may be, uh, you know, $200 silver might be sound big, but, you know, bread's 50 bucks a loaf. So how valuable is it, right? So we have to measure it in real terms. I'm not, I'm just saying that for the audience. You already know this, Patrick, but a lot of people get hung up. Uh, in fact, I have to make a joke here if I can. But um, and this shows you how people really don't understand money very well. Some do, some don't. But um, so I showed that to my mother-in-law one time. Right. Oh, boy. Yeah. And she goes, oh, if only it were real. <laughs> I said, it is. And even though I told her it was real, she still did not get the concept that a yeah. big number like that was worthless. Right. You know, and that's why the two hundred dollars or four hundred or so I'm trying and you already get the point, so does your audience. But we get hung up because we're taught to look at our net worth in terms of you know how many US dollars are you worth or how many Aussie dollars or you know how many euros or whatever. And we're taught to look at ourselves in terms of the paper price of our holdings. Whereas, you know, if you look at money being gold and silver only then basically if you own more silver today than you own two years ago, you're wealthier, regardless of what the paper price is at the time. Now, that's hard to swallow because it's a whole paradigm shift in your thinking. Yeah. But, you know, if we were on a silver standard and you had 10 ounces in uh, 2016 and you had 200 ounces in 2019, you'd know damn well that you were worth more. Yeah, because I, I get a bit nervous when I hear people giving targets. Um, they'll either say my, my target is 5,000 ounces of silver and I'll stop, or they say my, my target is $30 an ounce. And, and this is the part they're missing, just what you're, you're, you're exactly talking about now. Um, so I appreciate you saying that. 
But um, David, be, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about your work and the Morgan Report? Absolutely. Uh, so I have two lists. One is a free list. One is a paid list. The free list, you can go to themorganreport.com. Just give me an email address and we'll get you started. Every interview like this that I do will be sent to you. I do a weekly perspective where I wrap up financial news. Usually talk about gold and silver at the end. If you get on the website, <clears throat> themorganreport.com, uh, my favorite speculation, really of one of my most favorite speculations of, oh, I'd say, I hate to over amp this thing, but I don't know if it's of all time, but certainly in the 40 years plus I've been looking at this, it's an e-waste technology. So scroll mm -hmm. down and be sure to scroll down almost to the bottom to watch this little film clip there. Uh, I have a little icon on there that says, forget about Bitcoin, this revolutionary gold production story could make you a fortune. And um, you can watch that little movie. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see what you get in terms of gold from a really robust gold mine in terms of how much gold you get per ton. Right. And then you can compare that to this e-waste company. And it's unbelievable how much more gold there is in electronic waste than there is in a rather robust gold mine. But very few people know the story. Only subscribers of the Morgan Report are aware of it. Yeah, that's that's good to know. And um, if there is one takeaway that, that I got from this interview, it's it's the word honesty. And so it, mm -hmm. it's nice to hear that word. You, you rarely <laughs> hear that word anymore. So uh, honesty is where it's at. And maybe we can get some honest money along the way as well. So, uh, David Morgan, I, I do thank you for coming on the show. And, and as always, it's it's a pleasure speaking to you. And um hope we can do this one more time. And we wish you the best of, of health. Stay healthy, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that very much. That was David Morgan, publisher of The Morgan Report. For more of his insights on silver and the global economy, please visit his website, themorganreport.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.